Hello Oral Surgery colleagues and welcome to the Oral Surgery Podcast. I am your host Dr Richard Moore, an oral surgeon based in the United Kingdom. The aim of this podcast channel is to discuss ways of improving practice in oral surgery, thereby creating a better journey and patient experience and allowing us as clinicians to become better oral surgeons. All discussions on this channel are based on personal experience and opinions, which should be thought-provoking and supplemented with further research and evidence-based practice. Without further ado, let's jump into this podcast. Hello and welcome to this podcast, uh, which will be a discussion around third molars. I'm joined today by Imran Suida, who's a specialist oral surgeon working in Yorkshire, both in primary and secondary care. So welcome, Imran. Hi, Richard. Um, thank you very much for having me on. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Good. I'm, I'm looking forward to having a, a discussion. Um, so we're going to talk about third molars and the current literature, and this will be particularly pertinent to people in the UK, but certainly for those of you listening that are in other countries, it'll still generate a little bit of interest for you, hopefully. So certainly in the UK, everybody should be familiar with the NICE guidelines from 2000, but also recently we've had the um, parameters of care for patients undergoing mandibular third molar surgery, which was released by the Royal College of Surgeons. So I I don't know what your thoughts are on both of these, Imran, and and how it may have affected practice. Yeah, so obviously the the NICE guidelines in 2000 really changed our practice in that it it completely changed when we took out uh, mandibular third molars and when we you know when when they were indicated to be removed with especially within the nhs setting uh, and now the the royal college of surgeons parameters of care really updated that you know up uh, you know up in line with the, the most recent research papers that are out there and i think that today's discussion is going to you know is going to involve the rcs guidelines throughout really actually um there's some really interesting points that they've highlighted specifically about changes in what's been found in the relevant research and also about consent and Montgomery consent which I think will be popping up a lot in in today's podcast. Yeah I think there's some good points that you've raised there and other than those key guidelines particularly in the UK and it's interesting that you mentioned NICE and and NHS care because I think in NHS practice you are obliged to follow those but you may deviate slightly uh, potentially in your private sector but you know certainly that uh, patient-centred discussion and joint decision making which is coming up a lot nowadays and with Montgomery I think are two you know they're key things to really consider um so we've got some Cochrane reviews that are out there that um will be familiar to people and that they go back to 2012 and then uh, a couple of years ago with, with the most recent ones um and, and then kind of I, I mean is there anything you want to bring up on the Cochrane reviews that you think might be pertinent to uh, to our listeners yeah so the, the, there's three most recent Cochrane reviews in relation to mandibular third molars um, the, the least recent of those is the, the Lodi et al in 2012 and I think that ties in a little bit with your most recent podcast on, on antibiotic prescribing and this is also then tied in with the new RCS guidelines in relation to antibiotic prescribing for mandibular third molars and you know it, it highlights that it, it does you know antibiotics preoperatively can reduce infections in mandibular third molars, but the number needed to treat is actually 12. So that means 12 patients need treating before one infection is prevented. So therefore it's really important that, you know, that we, we assess our patients individually as to their infection risk. Are they immunocompromised? Have they got previous history of infections in the past? Is it a very, very difficult procedure and hence the prolonged procedure may increase the risk of infection. And so therefore we have to make individual judgments on patients. And I think that's, you know, it's really important to highlight that both the Cochrane Review and the, and, and the RCS uh, Parameters for Care document um, I like that antibiotics do work, yes, but there are risks associated with it, and therefore they shouldn't be given routinely. Um, yeah, and then moving I on. think that... Go on, sorry, yeah, I'll, I won't break your flow. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Carry, carry on, actually, before we move on to the next Cochrane review. I mean, I, I was just going to say, from, from what Wendy was saying, I think it's really difficult, isn't it, that, you know, to make that decision sometimes, do you... Because people talk about, oh, you know, uh, you want to get the prophylactic antibiotics in before the knife to the skin. And then sometimes it's unpredictable, isn't it? You, you do a case and you think, ah, oh, you know, this this probably would, would have been a great case for prophylactic antibiotics. But we've started now. 
are the post-op antibiotics going to be as effective as that prophylactic dose? And I was trying to kind of get Wendy to commit a bit to that, and she she wasn't, which is fine because it's it's really a, I guess a microbiologist's um, point about that that timing of the antibiotics, but also making that decision about which patients you think are likely to to benefit from them. Um, and, you know, is it is it the medical factors as well as the surgical factors and all that combined really is, is what we need to consider? Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's kind of like a multifactorial thing, you know, are they diabetic? Is it well-controlled diabetes? Do they taking steroids? Is it is a procedure planned to be particularly difficult? Is it very difficult just to angular with curved roots and therefore you're going to be taking longer on it, doing more bone removal and therefore the potential risk of infection are higher? So you're right it's that case by case case by case you know planning and and thought process before you prescribe anything preoperatively yeah so i'll i'll you can carry on with your flow about uh, cochrane (laughs) (laughs) and then obviously in 2020 you had the cochrane review on surgical technique for wisdom teeth um by um ed bailey Uh, and there's been a recent uh, webinar on this again really interesting points some of those about the differences in flap technique uh, and actually now in the most up-to-date guidance there is very little difference between the different buckle flap techniques whether it be triangular or envelope um, and that you know the platelet rich plasma platelet rich fibrin and can actually you know potentially reduce the incidence of alveolar osteitis and that you know something that's really interesting for the future as to further research into this as to whether it's going to be a benefit to our patients um, yeah, I mean, I, I might be a bit controversial here. I, I, I'm very much an envelope flap man with a distal re- relieving incision for the majority of my lower third molars, and I know that certainly when trainees have come through our unit, you know, oh, we, you know, I've been taught to do a mesial relieving incision, and that's fine. I'm not saying that you know my way is the only way, um, but I, I really struggle to see, and you know, you, I guess we could talk about this all evening, but how that mesial relieving incision would be of benefit to healing. Um, and, and I know there was some evidence there initially, but I, I, I struggled to accept that. Um, and also just on the back of that, the PRF, uh, we've just had a grant accepted at, at uh, our unit to start using PRF. So that hopefully, um, you know, maybe in 12 months time, we'll have some some hard data to be able to prove that actually it's beneficial because certainly anecdotally, I use that almost for every patient privately because we've not had the opportunity to use it in the NHS. So I'm hoping that we can get some good research to demonstrate that actually that is something we should be considering, if not routine. Brilliant. That's great news. Uh, we've just um, got a, a, a PRF machine in our practice, so it's something that I'm going to be um, using shortly too. Uh, and, and similarly in flap type, I, I, I used to carry out triangular flaps because that was what I was trained and what I was taught to do. However, as I've got more experience and you know, got more practice with wisdom teeth, I've actually now changed to an envelope with a distal relieving incision and I find healing is better, um, yeah. less pain potentially post-operatively and less, you know, less likely to have wound breakdown, and, uh, you know, yeah. very similar to, to, to your experience. And I, I think I prefer it from previously. Definitely. From a I mean, there are, it also means that you can future proof your design. Cause if you do need to extend that flapping, you've done a measly relieving incision, at the distal of the serum, you, you can't extend it anywhere, can you? Whereas if, if you haven't done a mesial relief incision and you think, oh, actually, I haven't quite got enough access here, you, you could extend that that envelope flap um, a bit further on. Um, and also, I just find that mesial relief incision a little bit awkward to suture. And I know some people say, don't suture it, just leave it. Uh, but yeah, it, it just seems to have more issues for me personally. And that, that may just be my my technique than, than benefits, really. So um yeah, yeah they're just my thoughts and i think finally in that cochrane review the other, other point that i found quite interesting was about lingual nerve protection in that it, it mentions mm. you know insufficient evidence whereas previously yeah. it used to say that it was an increased temporary altered sensation yeah yeah um, but but there was a more recent paper that again i found very interesting in, in bjoms it's called rapaport et al it's a systematic review into lingual nerve attraction yeah and they found a difference they found you know if you, you if you if you're doing lingual retraction and using non-purpose built retractors such as like a Howarth retractor or or something similar then yeah there's up to half nearly half percent permanent uh, lingual nerve injury uh, which again is mirrored by the people that work in 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 nerve injury units like like Sheffield um, 
and then okay. no lingual nerve attraction. The, sorry, the no lingual nerve attraction. The risk is you know, less than zero point zero eight percent. So very, very, very low. Yeah, and and you know the whole lingual nerve re- retraction and protection, whatever you want to call it. It flags up issues as well because I think sometimes you need to do it, don't you? And I know those times exactly. are probably few and far between. But if you've not done it sufficiently, you may be ineffective in doing it. So actually, the whole point of protecting that nerve, you've just made things a whole lot worse, and that nerve isn't protected. So it's really difficult to say how do you get experience in? Because when I was a you know a junior, we we almost did it for everybody. Um, that and the lingual split was the favoured procedure for the, for the appropriate patient. Whereas nowadays, you know, we've moved well away from that. But when you do need to do lingual nerve protection, if you don't have the experience of doing that atraumatically, then you actually may cause more damage than, um, you know, it's a risk benefit thing, isn't it? So it's really tricky sometimes uh, with these things. I completely agree. I think, um, Again, historically, I never used to do any lingual attraction full stop purely because I didn't have the experience. But then, you know, as I've as I've got on, as I've done more surgery, been involved in um, uh, orthognathic surgery, you, you, li- you lift a lingual flap as per standard for yep. orthognathic surgery. And just by doing that over and over and over again, it's just built that muscle memory almost to how to do it carefully yeah. and subperiostally in a nice, gentle manner. And therefore, when you do get the odd, really distal angular, really lingual uh, crowns of the mandibular third molars. Actually, it's, it's so useful to be able to do that carefully and control yeah. uh, and understand when you're subperiosteal so that you don't cause this harm. Definitely, uh, yeah. And, and you kind of need that practice to be able to, to be good at it if you're going to do it for certain cases. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I guess when, when we look at the literature other than, uh, oh, there was, um, what, we've just talked about the Bailey one, haven't we? Did we touch on the... Yeah, there was one more, um, and Caminia. this one is this. This is a very hot topic now. That there are a lot of papers looking into whether we should be preventatively removing mandibular yeah. third molars, um, and yet yeah, the the Gaminia et al. twenty twenty Cochrane review actually found that there was there wasn't sufficient evidence whether they should be removed or retained, but they did highlight some important points. And you know, there's lots of this now in, in a lot of the literature. Is that you know if you do retain certain aids, mesoangular, horizontal, that are partially erupted, there is potential risk of periodontitis in the in the second molars. Um, there's risk of caries, which we're going to come to shortly in the podcast, and and therefore it's really important that when you're examining a patient, when you're seeing a patient, so especially if you're in general practice, if they've got a mesoangular or horizontal molar. You know, make sure you examine it appropriately. Take radiographs if you think it's appropriate for assessment of that area. And there, you know, you need to consider what the patient's values are. You know, use your own clinical expertise and have shared decision making because you know it's an active decision to make to leave it alone if there is a risk. And at the same time, there's a there is an active decision to make to remove a wisdom tooth despite the fact there's no pathology. So there's no right or wrong answer. But it's really important of having that Montgomery, you know, consent and giving the patient their choice, knowing what are the risks of doing nothing and what is the risk of intervention. Yeah, yeah, and I think also just following on from that, you know, uh, I think some people or some of us are, are perhaps remiss at warning patients in the consent process that, that irrespective of the warnings for the third molar removal, etc., but also that risk of you know sensitivity or discomfort or issues with the distal of the seven afterwards that you know may not be a problem now. And I think that's something that that it caught me out many years ago with a patient who came back and um, was, was quite unhappy because they'd got significant bone loss of the distal of the seven, and it was really uncomfortable. And that was something we'd not discussed. And we you know we're going back fifteen years, so I think it's really important that as you say that. Uh, you know it, it is a shared decision making process but that that risk of everything that you can consider must must really be emphasized to the patient definitely i think there's some key so, points um yeah 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 there's um, just some key just just to add to what you said richard that if you know if you do leave it and they, they need to know what the risks are it's specifically things like perio and, and caries, which we're going to come to, but also as they get older, the risk of morbidity with taking out the wisdom tooth, if they come back with it later on, is going to be higher. Indeed, and so it's yeah. really important that they understand that. Yeah, yeah. That 30, 35, once you hit that, it's all downhill, isn't it? 
So, um, <laughs> yeah. And for those of you listening who are not in the UK, you know, it, it's common practice, particularly in the US, uh, to prophylactically re- remove third molars. Um, and as far as I'm aware in the UK, the only cohort of patients that that is acceptable a clear cut is is the military where certainly when I worked in Birmingham which was a military hospital we we would see quite a lot of um military personnel where if they got them they were having them removed uh, before they went went out to, to theater now I don't know if that's still common practice because we're going back you know 15 16 years but um that that certainly was my experience then so if we um let's move on to some of the current literature then that uh, is really topical uh, and I think I'm going to start with uh, Louis McArdle's PhD research, which is is quite interesting. And that's probably jumped the gun a bit, but I think it's it's really topical given what we've just discussed regarding impacted third molars and the risk of caries developing in the distal of the seven. And and should you know what what's the decision around that with with your patients really? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, reading this was really eye opening. I mean, I, I'd seen it in my own practice, but when you actually see the numbers that we're about to discuss it really really is eye-opening so yeah. we have yeah, the, the Mercado papers uh, you know 2019 and there's some papers by Allen in 2009 and, the, and there's a few others as well I think there's a meta-analysis in 2019 by Van Totling but yeah some really interesting numbers so distal cervical caries of lower sevens is now responsible for 44 percent of all mesoangular mandibular third molar removals in the in, in the UK and that's absolutely I mean that's crazy. Yeah, it's fifty percent, really, isn't it? It's half. That I think yeah. that's the the way to look at it. And it's just, and you're right. Until you see it written down and the evidence, because you you know, and all these things we see anecdotally, and you think, yeah, oh yeah, PRF is really good, but actually, I've, I've, I haven't got really hardcore evidence or distal caries in the sevens because of mesial angular H. Yeah, yeah, we see a bit of it, but when you see it written down as forty four percent, you think, wow, that actually is is really significant. Yeah, and and it says that you know that the latest meta analysis says that a third of all mesoangular rates will cause caries in the distal cervical of the sevens. That's a third of every single one, which highlights you know the, the real importance of of clinical and potential radiographic monitoring as part of your you know as a general dental practitioner. If you're doing bite wings, can you get it just slightly back just to show that that distal yeah. contact of the seven? Yeah. And then, uh, I guess, leading on from from his research, we've got other key papers, really. Um, I guess coming on to... Well, it, it, I was going to start to talk about imaging, but I guess we've got other things perhaps we can touch on with... Um, uh, do you want to talk about nerve injury first, or...? Yeah, that's a great idea. So um, we, we all know, like, the standard numbers we were taught at dental school, so... Um, you know, what I've got here in my head is, is Professor Loesch's paper from Sheffield in 2003, which says, you know, temporary risk to the inferior alveolar nerve is around about that 4 or 5% for a standard mandibular third molar and permanent is under 1%. And then the lingual nerve risk is, you know, it's variable. It, temporary can be anywhere between 0 mm. and 20 odd percent and permanent, you know, up to 2%. But that's what we've been taught. But what the really interesting numbers is when it becomes high risk. And actually, yeah. you, you get some of the high risk signs. And what does that mean for your patient? And again, is that Montgomery consent making that consent process individual to the patient that you've got in front of you? So um, one of the papers I like is that there's, there's a, a there's a meta analysis looking at coronectomies and high risk wisdom teeth. And that's Pitros's paper. And it, 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 it highlights that high risk wisdom teeth is up to 20 percent. So that's one in five patients will have temporary altered sensation for up to you know three months potentially and up to four percent of any high risk wisdom teeth will have potentially permanent uh, nerve injury and uh, other papers tar renton talk about two percent permanent nerve injury in these kind of patients and that's just a general average mm. and i think um, you know it's quite difficult to throw ballpark figures around with patients isn't it i think it's okay to do that initially but then i think when you've got your full clinical exam your imaging you know, and, and I will talk about imaging, but I think it's really important to, I try and show patients if I can, the, the images, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to be an oral surgeon to see where a canal sits close to a tooth apex. And I think that's quite important that patients, you, you know, it's a bit of patient empowerment, but that again, that shared decision making say, look, this is where the nerve sits. I can't tell you exactly where it is in this canal, but 
you can see the proximity between the apex of this this route or, or wherever you're working and, and this canal. So your risk is high. Although we talk about these figures, you know, you've got other features that that demonstrate this is potentially high risk. And that those figures are quite significant. And you know, the morbidity to the patient, it's it's life changing, isn't it? One hundred percent. I've seen patients who have had permanent nerve injury, and again, thinking about that Montgomery consent is that we've had patients that are professional opera singers. I had someone who was a high level opera singer that you know performed regularly and just performed in um, Royal Albert Hall like a, a year or two ago, and now can't sing anymore mm. because of the nerve injury. So she can't hit the notes that she used to hit because she can't feel her lips. And then had a high level flute player that was a soloist again, Royal Albert Hall player. Yeah, I don't know how we got two, two of these in one year. Um, but the, the, these patients had come from primary care. So they'd had a tooth treated in primary care and then come to us with a nerve injury. And again, this flute player could no longer play solos. She'd been downgraded in her band to just being part of the, the chorus because she could no longer hit the note she wanted to hit. And I think it's so important knowing your patient and making sure that any risks that you give them, not just numbness tingling, is actually relevant to them and how it could affect them. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, you know, we band about, you know, numbness and tingling and altered sensation, but I think it's really important to emphasise to patients that this altered sensation can be painful as well. And that is probably, I'm not saying having no feeling in your lip is acceptable, but to have no feeling compared to that neuralgia sensation or pain. And some of Tara's studies have, have demonstrated that, that actually it's significant morbidity to patients. So the wording on that consent and that conversation is really critical because quite often patients, you know, and I, I don't, I, I'm going to quote this, but I can't remember where I heard it, that patients only take away 15% of your consultation, what you've spoken to them. So it, you know, to get your important critical content in that 15% is really difficult. So I, I'm not saying I always do a hard sell and, you know, glass half empty, but I do think it's important to, you know, not paint the worst case scenario, but that they are fully aware of that and fully consented as, as per Montgomery. Yeah. And I, you know, if a patient shows high risk signs, um, and they might want to go, wish to go ahead with a removal, then I just, you know, highlight to them how that's going to affect their everyday life potentially based upon the experience I have seeing patients with that. So I'll say, you know, it might not just be numbness or tingling. It might not just feel like a, an injection's wearing off. It may be like spider crawling feeling, or it may feel like that you're walking through a web, or it may feel like every time you touch your lip, it could be an unpleasant feeling, unpleasant mm-hmm. tingling or burning feeling. And so that can affect things like, you know, you know, intimacy with your partner, or it can affect you if you're a public speaker, potentially, or a singer, or, you know, all those kind of things, and just make sure they understand what it means. It's not just numbness. Yeah. And and uh, identifying those high risk factors, particularly, I guess, initially on plain film, on OPT, there's that, uh, you know, original paper by Rude and Shiab at, at back in the 90s that, that demonstrates those. And then Tara Renton, more recently um did another paper was it 2017 looking at those high risk features yeah so she highlighted the the rude criteria so the ones that we just discussed and that that includes like um darkening of the root as it overlies the canal um where the the cortication so the white line the upper border of the id canal is uh, interrupted by the root um and also diversion of the canal where the canal goes around the tooth. And then she's also added an extra uh, points. So again, some of these were mentioned in the root paper, such as deflection of the root, so the, where the root hits the ID canal and deflects away, or whether the ID canal narrows as it goes past the root, um, as you know, those high risk signs as to where you want to be thinking about what to do next, almost. Yeah. And um I'm going to throw juxta apical area into the mix for you to, oh, yes. to comment on. Because <laughs> somebody asked me about this the other day and I was like, oh, that's a really interesting um, conversation. So what, I mean, I don't think it was that paper. It was, um, oh. it, was it was actually Renton's paper that is mentioned, actually, that one. Um, but there's so another, there's, I think there's, there's, yeah, I'm going to say Ghazala Umar at King's wrote a paper as well uh, in oral surgery. I can't remember the date though, and I'm sure that they looked at that as well. But um, yeah, so do you want to just comment on the juxtapical area and its its relevance? I mean, I've seen I've seen a few uh, juxtapical areas in my time, and you know, I have taken preemptive 
cone beam CTs to see because of yeah. what's been written in the literature, but as yet, I have yet to find a correlation yeah. between what I see on the OPT and the cone yeah. beam, in my, in my experience, however. I mean, it's difficult to to not do a cone beam for that, isn't it? To just have that reassurance. And I think, you know, I'm no radiologist, but <clears throat> to do a small volume cone beam, um, you know, your dose is much less than it used to be. And the information you're going to yield from that is quite high. But we'll, I guess we'll come on to cone beams in a second. But uh, those key, key factors there, looking at tracing that canal out on the plain film is really important to then determine you know, do you need any further imaging and what, what conversation you're going to have with your patient about that? And, and and then obviously it'll come on to management, which may or may not include coronectomy, which we'll, we'll come to in a second. Um, so yeah, so any, anything else you want to add on about plain film factors to, to consider? Uh, no, no. Uh, the only thing I would maybe say is that, you know, that there is a occasion in, in younger practitioners to want to take cone beams for everything that might well be potentially high risk because it's close by yeah but, you know there's there's the, there is the high risk signs but you, you you've really got to balance that so you've got to you know balance the benefits and risk of radiation as per your irma in 2017 um and you've then got to think to yourself if you're going to take it is it going to influence your decision is it going to change your outcome um, you know, why are you taking it? If it's just because the apex is just slightly very close, but the tooth needs taken out because it's grossly carious, the apex is straight, it's not curved, it's not likely to break, therefore you're not going to be doing bone removal in that area. Do you need to take a cone beam CT? So they, I think they're really useful. They, they really provide really good information about root formation, about where you can safely do bone removal, where you can safely elevate. And in some, some instances, it's absolutely brilliant. And they're, they're a game changer in that regard. But they're not for every wisdom tooth where the, the root is close by to the, to the nerve. Yeah, yeah. And, and you may even take one. And it's of no benefit because, you know, the, the cortication and the bone, it just doesn't... I've, I've got a few in my kind of... Dropbox of, of images that it's just no help at all. Uh, I mean, they're, they're rare, but you, you need to consider that. So, just thinking about CBCT factors and that meta analysis in, uh, ooh, I'm, I'm not going to try and pronounce that name in 2017. Um, <laughs> I think it's Clay of a Gero, I think it is in 2017. There we go. That's the one. Yeah. And also Renton and uh, Shiratori. I'll go for that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Identified some key factors, didn't they, for high risk AIDS? Yeah, so um, I'll go with the common ones first. So obviously the most common you're going to see on a cobium CT is where you've got um, no bony separations. That's what they often say. There is no bony separation between the mandibular third molar root and the ID canal. You know, the other, another word for that is interruption of cortication. So again, the corticated border of the ID canal is missing and the tooth is in direct contact with the nerve. And I think things to think about there on top of that is how long is that cortical perforation how long is it in contact with the root and i measure it and the evidence would be if it's more than three millimeters your risk is elevated you know even up to one third uh, of people could have permanent nerve damage if they have that elongated you know lack of cortication and contact between the root and the nerve again that's linked to how you take it out it's linked to your elevation technique as well but it's really important and then to add to that if it's like that and on top the, the nerve has been deformed in shape. So instead of being a nice oval shape, it looks like a, a, a dumbbell or it looks like a teardrop. I sometimes call it even a pear. It looks like a pear shape um, because the, 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 the nerve is being deflected or deformed by the root. Again, that risk even inflates even higher potentially because the root is compressing on the nerve. And when you then elevate, that compression causes a crush injury to the nerve. So they're, they're, the, like, they're probably the two most common things I see in my daily practice that have been mentioned. Uh, then it adds in a few other things like a polo mint, where actually a polo mint being uh, you know, a, a round root with a hole going through and where the nerve is going through the root. That's very rare, but you do get it every now and again. Um, and the, the final one really is, is where the ID canal is sitting lingual to the root and it's kind of being sandwiched between the root and the, and the lingual plate of the bone. So I kind of say that the, I tell, tell the patient that the nerve is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, and if mm. you elevate buccally, you're going to crush the nerve between the root and that lingual cortical plate. Yeah. So that I think they're the things that I see the most common. I mean, they just talk about other things like a bifid ID canal, and it does happen, but a bifid ID canals are relatively rare. 
Yeah. And uh, just a bit of a interesting fact that I was teaching on our master's program the other week and was talking about this and talked about polo mint and I just was met with blank faces, even through masks. <laughs> and I realized then that polo mints are not um, worldwide. So uh, ah. for those of you, if you're, if you are listening and not from the UK and don't know what a polo mint is, it's, um, I guess it's candy to the Americans. So uh, Google it, but you'll see what, what we mean uh, or read the paper, actually, because it's probably easy to look at the paper. But a polar mint is, is basically a mint with a hole in the middle. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so interesting. Um, yeah, Just trying to make it uh, accessible and inclusive. Uh, interesting CBCT factors there, then, that, that Imran's just talked about. And then the, the clinical factors that we've, we've talked a little bit about already. I mean, I said over the age of 30, but I think some of the evidence suggests that you know, over 24 sometimes, it, the, the frequency of nerve injury is higher, but certainly that 30, 35 plus. And this is one of the problems in, well, not problems, but we're seeing more, you know, patients living older. We've got an aging population with multiple comorbidities because medicine is so advanced now that that turn up with retained mandibular third molars. And it's complex. And that's what's causing potential um, or more likely to cause potential post-operative problems. Um, and then we've got other things, obvious things like inexperienced operators and, and the difficulty of the surgery. And those two married together, obviously, doesn't always give a good outcome. And I think everybody be aware that distoangulars are, are usually the most difficult and you need to have a plan for that. Um, and then some of the papers by Lung et al. in 2011 talks about, you know, uninterrupted dentition and the lingual flap and lingual split, which we've talked a little bit about. But also, obviously, if you expose the nerve bundle, um, the, the, the risk of an injury is is higher. Um, so, yeah, anything else you want to add to kind of high risk factors before we come on to a bit about cone beams? Yeah, I think just to add to that, I'm sure you've seen it in your practice that now the people that are presenting to us requiring third molar removal, again, because of the effect of the nice guidance is that they're presenting later. Um, so yeah. that, that mean age of the mesoangular group that are coming to us are in their 30s. Uh, and similarly, generally people coming with repeated pericoronitis and the like often can be, you know, older as well. And so I, I tailor that in that, you know, the guidance, I think it's, I think it's Loesch's paper in 2003. It's also now mentioned in the RCS parameter that as you get over that 35 age threshold your risk increases so i tell the patient look although it might you might be told by somebody that your risk is one percent permanent in your case you have a high risk sign and on top of the high risk sign you're older than 35 so your potential risk for permanent nerve injury according to the lotion paper is nearly 10 percent. so yeah. you know really that you need to really rethink that option for removal if you think it's unsafe for that patient and yeah. really have that discussion yeah. what is the benefits and risk for you and you make the decision that's best for you yeah. And I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to, I know in the implant world, the ITI have this SAC classification, straightforward, advanced and complex. And I think, you know, I've been desperately trying to get a paper out that, that incorporates that by, and certainly for our undergraduates and postgraduates, I try and get them to think in that, that, that way of, you know, all these risk factors that we're going to put together, is this going to be a straightforward procedure or is it going to be advanced or is it complex? And, and which of these points do I then refer to, um, you know, a specialist to, to take that, that or to, to carry that procedure out because of the risk? So I think it, it's really important that we, we put all this information together. I guess um, that'd be really useful, that. Yeah, it, well... <sighs> I say I've been writing it for a couple of years now with a colleague, but uh, it's like everything, isn't it? It's on the to-do list. <laughs> um, okay, so let, let's move on to um, imaging. Um, I mean, certainly in this country, in primary care, op I don't know what your experience is, but OPT machines seem to be less commonplace. Uh, so you may get a patient that comes, and this is going to be a bit, not controversial, but, you know, uh, when I coerce a radiologist into doing a podcast, this will be one of my questions. But um, do you, you know, the patient comes in, they've got a periapical of the lower rate. It hasn't quite got everything on that you need. Do you go for a, a sectional OPT or do you go straight for a cone beam, uh, five by five, small volume? And I know the answer according to guidance is uh, not the latter. But do, you know, do we think between us in the future it would be more sensible if doses come down a little bit that, you know, Alara and Irma may be modified a little bit because of the 
I guess the risk is you, you have a PA, hasn't got everything on, you do a cone beam, you think, oh, it's got the high risk features, I now need a, uh, sorry, you do an OPT, it's got the high risk features, and now I'm going to do a cone beam. Um, but I guess the flip argument is, if you do a cone beam after a PA, you may not need that information, because how many of these third molars are high risk? So I guess that's just something to, to consider, um, whether cone beams are going to be more commonplace in primary care practices. And, and like you said earlier, there is that risk that because we've got this fancy machine, it makes nice pictures that, you know, people will spend more time in those than taking intraorals that actually, if you take a good periapical, it can yield quite a lot of information. Oh, yeah, definitely. There's a lot of food for thought there, really. And, yeah, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there's some, some important points to pull from that is, you know, dosages. So, um, yeah. I, you know, the latest guidance actually tells us we should be talking about dosages with our patients in, in, in terms that they understand, whether that be days of background radiation or number of bananas, as some of the yeah. posters will yeah. show. Um, what the latest thing that I've got is, you know, an OPT is about one and a half days of background radiation-ish, somewhere around about there. Uh, and a, a, a modern small FOV CBCT like you would do for a low wisdom tooth is about five days, so about three times the dose-ish, somewhere around about there. And it depends on machine to machine. Mm, uh, yeah. Or you compare it to a flight to Spain. So uh, a flight to Spain is about three days background radiation, so two OPTs. Um, or you know, uh, one and a half flights to Spain is a cone beam CT. So actually for, for a patient to understand that, it's a bit easier. I think if you said a flight to Spain there and back, people would probably go for the cone beam, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Perhaps I'm just being a bit naive, but um, you know, I think when you put it into perspective like that, uh, it, it it does. But yeah, I think it's really important to know the machine. <laughs> Excuse me. It's really important to know the machine you've got and the dosage because they are variable, um, and I think that that's absolutely critical. So yeah. Um, and, and just to point out for those of you that, that are not aware, cone beam CTs in the UK, to be able to take one and report one as a non-radiologist, you need to do the two levels of training. So that, that's absolutely critical that you have that information. And if in any doubt, um, even if you've done that training, then you know I send my cone beams to, to a radiologist for reporting. Because I think you know if, if you've got any doubt, that's their specialty. They should be looking at that. So... And I, you know, also some people will be will be erring on the side of caution. I'm going to take a cone beam because I'm going to practice defensively, and and that's. I appreciate people's uh, thought process for that, but that's not going to help you because it's it's not defensive to to do that. Really, it's it's got to be about the the indications for taking it and for managing that patient's treatment appropriately with, with their consent. Agree, hundred percent agree. I, I only take it if it's going to allow the patient to have the right information to make the, the correct decision for them that's best for them where they can't make a decision because of it, it's potentially high risk and they don't know whether to go with you know coronectomy or extraction or where something's showing up on the on the OPT and it it shows me that that actually I I, I need to surgically plan this a bit more carefully and therefore yeah. that cone beam is going to give me that information I need to do that. Yeah. And certainly for here, we've got the FGDP selection criteria um, and the Sedentex CT from 2012, looking about uh, giving details about when CBCT is indicated. And they're two good, really docu- two really good documents to have a read of. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly the FGDP, I think, is really helpful for primary care practitioners to, to get their head around what they should and shouldn't be doing for third molars. Yeah, and and they all say the same thing, including the RCS 2020, and it basically says, you know, you can see that there's a close relationship. You think that it may well change your management options or how you're going to surgically manage it. Um, then actually, that's where it's potentially going to be useful. But otherwise, it's you know, it doesn't. It highlights and there's, there's papers that we're going to talk about. This they, they, they can't see any obvious change in outcome by taking the cone beam CT. So it may not change outcome potentially, but what it does. You know what it does do is give the relevant information both for surgical planning and for the patient yeah and uh you know as you've just mentioned that the you know cbct influence in the outcomes of aids we've already touched on the uh the paper that i can't pronounce from 2017 meta-analysis um but then there's a couple of others aren't there to to just mention yeah now that there's one that i find really interesting and they, and they looked this is cork mass et al in uh, I think it's IJOMS in 2017, and they actually looked at 
you know, a, a cohort of patients, 122, and actually how did it affect treatment? Did it change the physical management? So when they took the OPT, they made a plan, then they took a cone beam CT if it was high risk. And they said, does it change your plan? How are you going to take out the tooth? And they said it was. They said, in you know, in certain instances, it was superior to an OPT, cone beams are, into determine the direction of tooth removal. And that, you know, for me, that's that specific case where the ID canal could be uh, buccal or lingual and it's showing you know darkening of the roots it's showing high risk signs where there's probably no bony separation and it's relatively high up nerve buccal or lingual and you're not knowing where it is and therefore if it's lingual and you're doing buccal elevation are you potentially going to crush the nerve so it actually highlighted yeah. in the cohort patients that it did make a difference and that's why i i think they are potentially useful in that regard yeah and and also for the you know when we come on to coronectomy you know some people would argue well if you've got high risk signs on on the plain film you don't need a cone beam if you're going to do a coronectomy but i would probably argue de- depending what your high risk signs are and where that canal is that a cone beam actually is quite useful because it might be that you've that it, it demonstrates that maybe full removal might be appropriate um so i think that's another a bit of a debate isn't it and tara renton's paper discussed that um no, I'm not right. Oh, that's not correct, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She does. Yeah. She, she describes it really, really nicely. So she says that you know, it, you know, the risk of in her paper it says two percent risk of uh, permanent nerve oh, yeah. injury in high yeah. risk patients. So because of that, in a hundred patients, ninety eight will have no permanent nerve injury. So therefore, that cohort of patients, if you'd taken a CBCT where they've shown the high risk signs, instead of going for a coronectomy, you could have gone for a safe removal based upon what you can yeah. see on the cone beam CT and plan it appropriately. And I think that's completely true because I've seen yeah. plenty of cases where it shows high risk signs on the OPT and then you get the cone beam and actually there's bony separation. So you can really carefully plan, section yeah. the tooth to reduce any pressure, you know, remove bone in a safe place that's away from the nerve and take it out safely. Yeah. And then, and, and, and coming nicely onto coronectomy, then really, because some people would argue that, and I know this is probably historic, that you know you're better off taking the whole tooth out because you know we do see patients with certainly anecdotally in my practice, and I don't think this is just my technique, but certainly in my unit, we seem to see more patients with postoperative problems following coronectomy than those having had full removal. Now, I, I don't have data to prove that but it's just that gut feeling in clinic you know or there's another patient who's come back and quite often it's pain and swelling that is probably surgical in nature it's nothing particularly different it, it they just seem to have more a stormier post-operative period than those who've had a full removal i don't know what your experience of that is or whether you agree yeah, so we, we've audited our coronectomies and we're about to re-audit it now, actually. And we, we, we find actually it's roughly the same. So they might say that, okay. you know, up to, you know, 10% or one in one in three potentially post-operative mandibular third molars are going to have some form of a problem. And we find that coronectomies are similar. And I think it's so important if you're going to do one to tell the patient that actually, you know, that there is potentially no difference in infection or dry socket rate or, you know, potentially even more potentially um, if food's getting trapped in that pocket afterwards so that it's no different or potentially slightly more than you know your your, mm. your remote removal and actually it's not going to make it less just because you're taking less of the tooth away um and i'd like to see those patients if they do cause any problems because i can then potentially intervene irrigate it clean it yep. show them how to keep it clean and therefore yep. hopefully make your coronet to be more, more likely to be successful i mean you say that your numbers are similar but i'm guessing that your coronectomy numbers are less than your full extraction numbers for third molars yeah true yeah we don't, we so don't do I, coronectomy that that often you won't yeah so i wonder if you know if it was like for like whether it would be higher um we we've we're in the process of auditing hours so it'll be interesting to see what what that shows and um just compare the two really so coronectomy indications for i think people always ask this and I know there's been a lot of work done on this by a variety of people, uh, you know, across the pond and, and in the UK, particularly at, at Guys and Kings. And, you know, Tony Progwell's done a lot of work, hasn't he? But, you know, your take on the, the indications for coronectomy and, and I guess contraindications as more so as well. Yeah, so I think really it's got to be a patient-led decision based upon the information you've given them, the clinical findings, the radiographic findings, and it's got to be where there is definite high risk signs 
that can't be mitigated easily by surgical removal. Um, and those high risk signs are potentially going to cause the patient long term nerve injury and the patient does not wish to undergo that risk. So where the patient has, you know, has a low risk tolerance and potentially high risk signs there. And then you've got to combine that with clinical factors. So, you know, we know that coronectomies are more likely to f- fail in young females with slim, like almost like a parsnip shape or carrot shaped roots, conical roots. Um, on really narrow ones, more likely to fail. They're the ones that are going to fail intraoperatively where the roots become mobile midway through the procedure. So we had one where my colleague was removing the other day and yeah, the whole tooth just came up with it as part as the part when they mm. tried to section. And it's just, you know, it's probably going to happen anyway because it's such slim, slender roots. Any force is going to uh, yeah. elevate it out. And the patient wasn't numb afterwards. So maybe the decision for that patient wasn't correct. Actually, it may have been better to, to remove it. Um, they also talk about where the teeth are really horizontal and really high up because actually trying to get three millimeters under the bone is actually very difficult or where it's a really odd angulation like such as lingually or very very low down in the mandible and hence you're going to struggle to remove all the enamel appropriately Mm. and and i think that the point you've just made there about starting the procedure and actually it becomes a a full extraction that's really important to mention that in the consent because it's um I'm going to say more so when when it's a general anaesthetic, but it, it is important under a local anaesthetic because you don't want to have that conversation mid-procedure. But it's absolutely critical that you mention that. And, and Tara mentions that in her papers. And I think, uh, is it Claire Gleason that had done, there's a couple of nice papers outlining uh, coronectomy procedures. And it's important that, that that consent process includes the fact that, you know, if the roots become mobile or everything becomes mobile during the procedure, then we're obliged to remove the entire tooth but also the risk of the complications afterwards and it may be that at a later date those roots become infected or they become symptomatic and therefore require removal and certainly I've seen in in my clinical practice a couple recently that were absolutely you know super high risk did a coronectomy and they've come back in pain and I thought oh no and one in particular I went straight for a cone beam so I thought I just need to see where this is and ridiculously, it was almost in the soft tissue. And, you know, she came back, a bit of local anaesthetic and popped it out. And, you know, she's happy. But she was warned that 18 months, two years down the line, if not sooner or, or later than that, you may well require a second procedure. So it's important that, again, those patients are aware of that. 100%. I think, you know, when I sit down with a patient and carry out the consent process, I think it's probably the most important aspect of coronectomy as well as the surgical procedure and is them knowing what it means to have one done and what are the side effects. And, yeah. you know, I tell them that if you're going to have one, it's going to reduce your risk of nerve injury by about eight times. And that's from the latest, I think it's a PITROS 2020, which is systematic review meta-analysis that, you know, there is that chance of the root growing up um, over a period of six months to two years and you know if it does do that I kind of see that as a success because when you yeah. do that second procedure it's really easy to do it's less risk yeah. for them and actually it's a failure but it's a late 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 failure but that late failure is potentially a success in terms of nerve injury risk and then you have yeah. the intraoperative failure so in the procedure as you mentioned we mentioned you know loose roots we're gonna have to take it out are you okay with me doing that you know, if, if it's loose, I've got to take it out and you've got to agree to that if I'm going to do this. Yeah, okay. And finally, so you've got intraoperative failure, you've got the late failure and you've got early failure where you've come back, you've had an infection, we've tried to clean it, debride it, but it's not worked and you're still getting repeated you know, symptoms, infections, then we're going to have to reoperate and about 2% require that reoperation. So it can fail, but 98% of the time it's going to succeed. And if we reoperate early, there's that risk again to your nerve. And the patients say, well, actually, does that mean that actually, if I do it now, there's a relatively good chance of success. But if I have it done again the second time, is it just the same same risk as me having it done now? And I'm like, yeah, it is. If you have it taken out now, or if you have it taken out as a second stage, the risk is similar. So a lot of the times when it's a really high risk, they're like, well, I don't want that risk. I want to try my best, you know, to keep this area clean. And I'll, I'll give the coronectomy a go in that instance. Yeah, yeah. So it's just imparting that information to the patient and having that shared decision-making process. So finally, let's just touch on contraindications to coronectomy because I think some of these, some patients will, some some colleagues might um, not challenge, but certainly there's 
a drive maybe to consider coroneting more teeth than we used to when when coronectomy became I'm going to say in vogue that's perhaps a bit unfair but when it became more popular and more of an accepted procedure uh, the contraindications that that we would follow nowadays really yeah I mean traditionally carious teeth carious wisdom teeth were completely contraindicated um, yeah and we used to say no you have to have a removal uh, in again high risk teeth but there's been two papers, Darren Jani and Smith in 2018 and Neil Patel's small paper in 2019. And both of those highlighted that actually, you know, from the n- small numbers they have, that, you know, outer dentine caries is potentially okay, it's successful. And since I've seen those papers in 2019, I've been, you know, offering patients that option if they're in the outer third of dentine and saying, yep, look, yep. You know, potentially it's a slightly higher risk of failure. But in my practice, you know, so far, I haven't had any failures in any carious teeth that I've been doing in three years. We follow all of ours up uh, and I give the patient the option. I say, look, it might fail, but actually so far we've, we've had relatively good results. Um, and I would agree that still carrying on doing that option, actually, it, you know, is potentially okay. I wouldn't do it pulp. Or I wouldn't do deep caries because obviously caries can be deeper than it appears on the radiograph. Mm, but out yeah. of third of dentine, you know, I, I, I give it as an option. Yeah. And then we've got the medical aspects, haven't we? other than the local factors, or I guess the other local factors to touch on is pathology. Um, yeah. Pathology that's not within, you know, either within the tooth, but we've talked a bit about caries, but other pathologies that would surround the tooth that, that would be contraindications. So I think if it's a dentigerous cyst, um, then, you know, th- there is no harm in offering a coronectomy as part of it if it's very, very high risk. So cysts are okay. To potentially coronate. I mean, I wouldn't offer that necessarily in a keratocyst, um, mm. but in a dentigerous cyst potentially. Um, but again, I wouldn't offer it in a, in a benign tumor such as a, a unicystic ameloblastoma, which tends to present that way. But it's potentially an option there. And then going into the medical side, you know, in those people that are immunosuppressed, those people that have poorly controlled diabetes against steroids, or they've got other factors such as. Um, they're on bisphosphonates or had radiotherapy or they've got some way of impairing healing and I, again I tell that to the patient I go I am properly reliant on your body to do the healing for me I will do the best job I can do to make sure that I remove the crown I'll make sure it's three millimeters beneath bone there is no enamel left everything's nice clean and smooth but then the rest and closing obviously and then the rest of it's up to your body to do the healing and obviously you yeah. keep it clean as well as your body to heal so and if, the, if there is some impairment in healing then actually that's increasing that risk of failure. Yeah. And then just, uh, you're more of a bookworm than I am, Imran. I think I read somewhere by Tony Pogrell that he gives a pre-op dose of antibiotics before his coronectomy. Is, have I dreamt that? Or I, I've seen that. I have seen that. And there are times that I will give that as well. Uh, for a similar reason to to reduce the risk of failure um i don't think i've seen any high level evidence to highlight that and so therefore i don't use it routinely but where i think there is a potential increased risk okay. of failure you know just i'm thinking about you know patients who might well be on, on you know the, the higher risk of dry socket type patients so females on the pill um, yeah, yeah diabetics all th- those kind of things that's where i'm thinking i, I seem to think it's in in his big red book but i could be wrong yes. and i keep meaning every time i mention it to people to actually find the reference um then finally your coronectomy patients do you do you take a post-op x-ray do you follow that you what's your follow-up protocol for these patients um uh, so yeah we see them all and again the question is is how early do you see them do you see them relatively early in their healing journey in a couple of weeks or do you see them later on in six to eight weeks? I personally mm. like to see them earlier. Why? Okay. Because if there's a problem, I can intervene. I can do something. I can irrigate. I can show yeah. them how to irrigate. Sometimes I'll even give them uh, a monoject syringe, which is a plastic syringe with a plastic curved tip that's blunt. Uh, but I don't want them to put it in the wound. I just want them to use it to gently irrigate the area to prevent food packing in the area. So I think that, that sometimes I do like that. And I find that then when I review them the second time, if there's a problem the first time, it's completely healed. So for me, that intervention potentially is working. Um, but then others review later on at six to eight weeks. And then, you know, it's either f- and worked or not worked at that point. Do you image irrespective of symptoms or only image if there's the asymptomatic post-op? So I, I don't personally do any imaging unless um, 
they've come in with um, uh, like a recurrent problem. So first stage, if there's a little minor issue, I'll do local measurement, you know, cleaning, irrigation, sure. you know, yeah. or hygiene instruction. If they come back again with a problem, then I might do. And the reason being is in case there's any enamel left behind, because obviously that is a cause of failure. So and I want to make sure that that's not the cause of them coming back. Um, and I find that okay. works well because of, often I would say that, you know, at least 80 to 90 percent of people coming back with a first stage of issue, whether it be a dry socket or a mild infection, it's it's sorted just by local measures and they don't need a radiograph because at the second time it's completely completely mucosalized, it's completely healed and they're symptom free by that stage. Okay. And then just to finish off, uh we talked about PRF and I, I you know I've I've said my bit on PRF and I think um um I probably should have talked about local anesthetic maybe, but I'll just throw into the mix that I tend to give articane infiltrations for almost everything, including impacted third molars. So I don't give blocks unless I need to. I, I tend to find that articane infiltrations, buccally and lingually, are successful in maybe 95, nine, a bit higher patients. Occasionally, if it's an impacted ape that I need to make a cut into the pulp, then the odd patient will get a twinge and I'll just infiltrate some articane into that cut. But I'm, I'm, I'm converted, having worked at King's, to giving almost exclusively articane infiltrations for everything. And then secondly, or finally, really, do you have any experience or do you use steroids for all of your third molars? And if you do, how do you administer those steroids? Do you give them IV orally or have you any experience of giving them uh, locally? Because certainly when I was in Canada and Chicago uh, or Vancouver and Chicago, rather, uh, they they would almost routinely give uh, steroids uh, post-op in in the air locally to to the the surgical site wow so i've not, I've not heard of uh, local steroids being given into the, the operative site but definitely um uh, iv steroids in a situation where you're in a theater in a you know, theater setting so it's interesting to highlight that the, the rcs guidance in 2020 actually says that where there is an opportunity there is actually evidence to justify iv steroids given perioperatively um, in, in surgical aid so it mentions four or eight milligrams of dexamethasone uh, and that and that's what we give in so i find obviously the most difficult mandibular third molars tend to occur under general anesthetic in our in our setting in, uh, in england and hence those type of patients where it is difficult where there is going to be a significant bone removal we do ask our anesthetist to give iv uh, dexamethasone i personally though have not given that myself um under local okay. anesthetic or under conscious sedation but it's something that potentially you could look into because actually the guidance is there to, to, to justify yeah, yeah. it. It's even evidence grade A. So. And quite a lot of anaesthetists give that as part of their pre-med as an anti-emetic as well. So it, it's kind of a, a double whammy. But it's funny for those patients that we operate under GA, sometimes they get a different experience, don't they? Because they've got IV access. Whereas in clinic, under local anaesthetic, you might not consider giving them antibi- uh, uh, steroids because you haven't cannulated them. But... You could have given them an oral dose pre-op, I guess, couldn't you? Uh, to 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 um, for the, for that reason, but um, yeah, interesting. But yeah, there's um, there's a there's a paper somewhere. I'll dig it out uh, and I'll send it to you on local steroid use in uh, third molars. Very interesting. Um, so just yeah, similarly a... with that, sorry, just similarly with that, actually, that you know, it's quite commonplace in those people having full arch implant surgery as you might know that they do tend to give uh, dexamethasone for those having things like zygomatic implants and the like yeah and if it's been done in practice that does tend to be given orally actually preoperatively and potentially postoperatively yeah I, I start them on a day a day before the surgery <clears throat> for things like all on fours and zygos um, the day of and then a couple of days after with oral steroids so definitely something to consider Mm, well, I'm impressed. Think. I've I've read a paper that you haven't, Imran, but I need to find it and send it to you to prove the point. <laughs> but um, listen, it's been an absolute blast. Uh, thanks very much for joining me. I know we've had a bit of a whistle-stop tour through third molars, but I hope that's really helpful for our audience. And, you know, as ever, um, thanks very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and just one point to highlight before we finish, actually, that I, based upon some of the stuff we've been discussing, I'm actually... Um, going to be making a, a little Instagram series uh, uh, about mandibular third molars and about what's out there and, and about things like um, high risk signs on cone beam CTs and when to take cone beams and things like that on my on, on my page in the near future. So um, watch this space. 
yeah and what what is your instagram profile for people that want to follow you and i would highly recommend following him as well because you will learn loads so yeah my, my name is imran sweeter and the actual tag is uh, learn oral surgery with me that's classic excellent well thanks again imran and um i'll uh, catch up with you soon thank you for your time richard it's been a pleasure see you soon bye bye Thank you very much for listening to this podcast and any resources will be linked in the description. Please do leave a review and rate the podcast on the iTunes store. I hope you join me for the next episode. Goodbye for now.